gives you a little bit my roommate back here. <laughs> it's not of the weather, but she's fine here. We can get out. And uh, I think she's going to survive. I'm glad of that. She's had, had her, her rough road. Well, she's getting later and later at the time of the time. I get her up a while. She's more oh, sure. She is. Morning, sir. Good to see you. Maybe the last one in will shut the door. I'm going to start a little early. Uh, we'll begin with a prayer, and then we'll begin with some basics that I think you want to cover from our study last week. I uh, appreciate you being here and uh, your desire to study. Uh, let's bow together in prayer. Father, we come confessing our need and our desire, our need to know you, but more than that, we ask you to help us even have a greater desire to know you and know your will. Bless us to that end as we study in Christ. Amen. Amen. By way of review, you've got some material in hand. I want you to look at it. So we can find some things that will help you there. I think basic concepts. Uh, the Bible contains only three things. What are they? Facts, promises, commands. Facts, promises, and commands. Facts are what happened. You know, I, I sometimes tell people that history is what happened. Now, the historical record may not be what happened, so it doesn't qualify for a study. But a fact is that which has happened, that which is, that which is, that which is real. A, a promise from God is secure or insecure. How many promises did God make to us in Christian age? Make the promise of the forgiveness of sins. And the hope of heaven, but in the middle of it, he promised us sonship, that we can be his children. Those are the three basic promises you have. What can you do with faith do with a, a promise? What can faith do with a promise? All right, if I promise to meet you tomorrow morning at a certain place or at a particular time for, and I will give you X number of dollars. Uh, all you can do is what? Sure. Trust me to keep the promise, show up at that time, at that place. That's all you can do. Uh, faith cannot make a promise uh, be fulfilled. Uh, what can faith do with the command? Obey. What can faith do with the command? What can any person do with the command? If you will notice. This is a holy room. <laughs> they hold it for several years. Yeah. <laughs> Put a hole in the door. Uh, well, the command. Uh, you can either accept or reject the command. You can obey or not obey uh, a command. There's something rather interesting, though, in the list of, of statements that you have. The next words that we have. We talked about them last week with regard to because God has given us certain things we are capable of Making decisions, of listening, of, of hearing. God gave us eyes, expecting us to do what? See. He gave us ears to, which to hear. He gave us a heart with which to understand. Now that's all in the language of Matthew 13. You've got a, a quotation there of, of the book of Psalm, Isaiah, where Isaiah said, uh, God said this is what's going to happen. These people have eyes but don't hear. They have ears but don't hear. They have hearts, but they did not understand. Well, it's, it's a matter of record that not everyone uses the intellect that they have, the intelligence that they have, but we have a certain level of intelligence. How many of you know what your intelligence quotient is? What's your IQ? Do you particularly care? I'd be scared to find out. <laughs> Pardon? I'd be scared to find out. <laughs> Comical, true story. I had a wedding for a young couple. She was a reporter for the Associated Press. Uh, and her 
IQ was off the charts. She was just 172 was her was her known registered quotient. Uh, she was a, an interesting young lady, but wound up like a nine-day clock. She could not be still. And she chattered all the way down the aisle as she came to down to, to meet her groom, talking to him, and he's up front. And she gets a hold of him to stand there and just does this the whole all during the service. And when it's over, this woman with extreme intelligence uh, kissed him on both cheeks, then on the lips, then on the nose. And she was wound up. Now, what was going on? Intellect or emotions? Emotions is what all of us have. And, and when you begin dealing with this whole premise with regard to emotion, uh, we have an interesting scenario here. We think in terms of emotion. Emotion, we're talking about what? How is what is how is emotion expressed? She was nervous. That was emotion. What else? Emotion. How do insecure people relate to others? Insecure. Insecure. Insecure people are typically quiet. Very quiet. Very quiet. And even withdrawn. It takes them a while to build relationships, and what's going on is their emotional makeup. Uh, we talk about love and hate. Are those emotions? In a very clear respect, they are. Now, here's a word we don't use very often when we talk about emotion, but what about desire? Desire. If we have a desire to know something, what are we going to do? Well, intellectually, we don't know it, but we want to know it, and our emotions, are, our desire is motivating us to want to know this, so we're going to move according to our desires. Uh, and that's just touching the hem of the garment, but the, the edge of the subject. But desire is, a, is an emotion. Let's go a little further. What about passion? I'm talking about passion for God, passion for truth. Passion for what is right or good, what is true. Passion is that a, is that a, an emotion? Say yes, it is. <laughs> and you begin dealing with this whole thing with regard to the emotions, and we're responding. And uh, biblically speaking, faith involves us with intellect. It also involves us with emotion, and then we come to a point of making a decision, and that's called what? It's volition or will. And then conscience. Where in the mix does the word conscience come in? Does it come in up here when the intellect goes into operation and we learn something? Does conscience immediately click? What about uh, emotions themselves when they, when they are stirred? And be it known that our conscience, what does your conscience do? Your conscience is not your guide. We'll get to that later, but I want to make one basic point here. Uh, your conscience either approves or disapproves. And when your conscience approves of something, your emotions say what? Yay! <laughs> or the equivalent. When your conscience does not approve, what do your emotions say? You feel guilt. Guilt. Uh, a foray of emotions, of of discouragement, after a while of depression, uh, there are all kinds of things that are going to happen, and there are many people who go through life, uh, and they someone says they have emotional problems, and it's manifesting itself as emotional problems, but 99 times out of four, they have a problem with what? Doing what is right. Conscience. Now, the question is, is all right, we look at those and we think with regard to the subject of faith, uh, whereby we come to respond to God and come to know God, and you begin dealing with this whole premise. Now, we've talked about faith, belief, conviction. We've talked about trust and loyalty. You begin dealing with all of those, and there's, there's a, a unique question that comes up, and it's basically our, our, our focus in our study here. When God calls us to faith, when God asks us to believe, when God commands us to believe, in reality, what is God after? What does God really want? Your heart. Pardon? Your heart. 
Your heart? Come on, what else? What's God talking about? What's God asking us to be? What are believers? What are people who are loyal to God? What are they? What's God really talking about? He talking about obedience. Obedience is a manifestation of the faith. When God requires something to be done and you do it, you're responding to God. But there's one salient point that I want you to get. What God is after, what God is wanting us to do is to enter into a relationship with him. Now, faith is not, faith has more to do with relationship than anything else. Faith in God. Without God, we, without faith, we cannot what? Please him. Cannot please him. For those who come to God must do what? Believe, believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently, Diligently seek him. I think there's that word desire. Desire involves diligence. Diligence involves desire. And that whole premise with regard to our coming to God. Now, the emphasis that is played out in many people's lives is, well, I believe. Or I'm a believer. Now, biblically, if that is true, that means you are in a right relationship with God. Oh, he got him upset. He's leaving. <laughs> no, he's, he's taking care of the attendance. I appreciate him doing that. But you look at this whole thing with regard to what, what faith is. God is calling us to a into a into faith. He's calling us into a faith relationship. Now you, you not having are you having any trouble with what I'm saying? He is calling us into a faith relationship. Now, if you began dealing with this whole premise with regard to a believer, biblically speaking, is someone who is in a faith relationship with God. I must confess that uh, through the years, I've noted that there are very few people who go beyond faith and belief in their definitions. And they don't have to, as long as they understand what faith and belief are. You go a little further with the word trust. Trusting God. Trusting Him. And then you'll come down to that last point, which we have looked at carefully, or tried to anyway, is loyalty to God. Now, the dynamic of the relationship involves all of those. Faith, belief, trust, conviction, and loyalty. But I'm going to add something else to it. The right relationship with God involves us with a passion for God. You can't be indifferent toward God or diffident, if you want to use that expression. You're involved with a, an intensity, a passion of relationship. Newlyweds, let me ask you a question. How many times a day does he need to tell you that he loves you? I'll be honest. <laughs> in the morning when you leave. Before we go to bed. How many times do you need to tell you that... Uh, Quite a few, apparently. Quite a few. <laughs> Pardon? I thought it was understood. But, yeah. I thought it was understood. <laughs> How many times does a man need to tell his wife that... Okay, let's ask someone who's been married. How many times do you need to tell your wife that you... A day, you love her? Probably a couple. I, I should. <laughs> <laughs> At least two. At least two. How many times a day does he need to tell you that that, you, that he loves you? At least a couple of times. Boy, minimal, minimal requirement here. Susan, what about you? A couple of times. A couple of times. No, but. <laughs> But in reality, beyond his telling you, which is important. Now, I had a friend by the name of Don Riggs. His wife's name was Stella. And he liked to tell the joke. In fact, he told the joke a number of times. He said, I told her before we got married that I loved her. And if I ever changed my mind, I'd let her know. <laughs> it's a miracle he survived over 60 years in there. But he did. Uh, what's involved in that communication of, of that, that expression? On the other hand, how many times does a man need to be told that he's loved? 
by his wife per day. Hmm? She comes on home. I know that she lives with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. how, many, how many times? How many times? Carrie, how many times? I don't know. I like to hear it. You know, and I know the numbers often, you know, when I should tell her. Yeah. You know, it's probably not a number, but we, we both need it, you know. All of you need it. But this, this whole thing uh, is rather interesting. Quote, the experts, and I are not one, but the experts say that a woman needs to be told by her husband at least seven times every single day that he loves her. And the man can survive without being told that if he knows that she respects him. What do you say? <laughs> But you look at the difference. But when we talk about loving someone and and respecting someone, you're talking about qualities in a relationship. And the whole emphasis of the New Testament, and I think we would be so much better served if we could come around to the concept. And possess the or be be possessed by the concept. And let me visit that for a moment. My father knew Red Skelton. Any of you know who Red Skelton was? You young people never heard of Red Skelton. You know who Red Skelton was? You're about his age, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> he made this statement about Red Skelton. They were in the uh, in uh, met in the army. He said Red Skelton did not have a sense of humor. You ready for that? He said, it had him. Hmm. Now, there's a difference between someone who has a sense of humor. and you, you know, some, some can act out a role and they get on the stage and they perform, but they really don't have a sense of humor. That may be a stretch for some of us to get our minds wrapped around. <clears throat> but you begin dealing with this whole thing. There is a sense in which the Christian not only has faith, but that faith has him. Has him. It's expressed. It is communicated vis-a-vis -vis the necessity of respect, of admiration, and desire, and passion. I want to go to the outline. I think I have this in, in, before you begin dealing with this, this whole thought. Uh, the greatest commandment of all, Jesus said, was what? You shall love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Cut to the chase. What's he saying? I love him. You are to love him how? With your whole being. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What kind of relationship does he want us to have? A faith relationship and a love relationship. He, he goes so far as to say, if you love me, you will what? Keep John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep it. Is that a promise? It works out. If you love God, you're going to keep his commandments. Uh, he, he's the one who says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do the things that I say. Uh, what's the problem? The problem has to do with the realization that you're someone who's saying one thing, but his actions are saying something very different. Now, I want you to look at some words that are familiar to us. And uh, this is on the second page of this. The word salvation, the word righteousness, justification, reconciliation. What do they really mean? Second page of exercise one. What do these words mean? Salvation. What is salvation? What does it mean? What does it connote? Jesus and he that believes and is baptized shall be what? Saved. saved. What does it mean to be saved? Well, thank you for your answer. What does it mean to be righteous? To be righteous. Be right with God. Did you say something? Yeah, to be right with God. To be right with God, you've got that answer. Does that fit on number one? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, justification. <clears throat> what is justification? Here's what's interesting. Every single one of these words actually
actually finally come down to one meaning, the same meaning that fits all of them. What is it? Right relationship with God. If you were saved, you were in a right relationship with God. If you are righteous, you are in a right relationship with God. Now, there is a righteousness that comes up, and those are our acts of righteousness, but the bottom line is we want to be in a right relationship with God. Justification means we're in a right relationship with God. Reconciliation is right relationship with God. Here's something else, too. Where is salvation found? In Christ. In Christ. In Christ. I in Christ. What is in? I in. What is that? It is a preposition. Everybody knows what. In Christ. Into Christ. But here's something rather interesting. It is according to Davis's eight case Greek grammar. A loca it is a locative preposition. Now tell me what a locative preposition is. Locates. It locates. But he's careful to insist that when, uh, instead of my giving you the language, let me tell you something. If I say my brother is in Georgia, and he used to be, he's not there now. He is in Georgia. Georgia is what? A state. It's a place. If I say my brother is in the army, same preposition is the army a place? Yeah. How many years were you in the army? I wasn't in the army. You were in the Air Force? Mm -hmm. That's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> How long were you in TZ? How long were you in the Air Force? Six years. Six years. If you say he's in the Air Force, does that mean he's in a place? You ruined it for me. You know, uh, I asked a fellow what it means to be in the army. He said, it's not a he said, it, it is a place. I said, what is it? He said, a place called misery. <laughs> he was at Bay Rapid. It's the fort up in Missouri. It's misery. No, but in the Army, that means that you bear such a relationship with, or in the Air Force, that you bear such a relationship with the Air Force that you are a, what were you called? Airman. An airman. You're not a civilian. Now, here's what's rather interesting. You go through the New Testament and you pick up the number of times it talks about us being in Christ. When a person is baptized, they're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26, 27. When a person, if a person is in Christ, they're in a relationship. They're in Christ. Because the word connotes relationship, not a location. So to be in Christ is to be in a right relationship with God. It is to be saved. It is to be righteous. It is to be redeemed. It is to be justified. It is to be reconciled. And all those big words finally come around to one, one basic meaning, to be in a right relationship with God. Here's something else that's rather interesting. The word faith itself has to do with, and I'll give the definition to you here in this outline. It's the word distill. And it's trust that culminates in obedience if obedience is required. It's trust and it leads and culminates in obedience if obedience is required. Well, someone said, explain that to me. Well, you can't obey a fact. You can accept it. You can't obey a promise. You can accept it. But you can obey. And in fact, you're required to obey a command. We'll come to that in further study. But I want you to get a hold of it. And then this word, which is very common in our vocabulary, is the word, what is it? Mispronounce it for me. What is it? Metanoia. That's the word for, what word is that? I know your preacher said, heard it. I've heard him say it since I've been here. It's repentance. But now repentance, if we're not careful, becomes sort of a, well, it's an obligation, sort of a rule or regulation. But look at the definition. It means to think differently, to feel compunction. There's intellect, there's emotion, there's will, there's conscience. That process whereby one changes his mind towards sin and does what? Returns to God. Returns to God. Now, it's interesting 
All these words line up. To be in Christ is relationship. To be baptized into Christ is into a relationship. Uh, to trust God is to enter into a relationship. It's vital that we enter into a relationship in obedience to his will. Repentance is a returning to God, turning from sin and turning to God. You see the correlation from sin, from the world, to God, to Christ. Now these are all basic, and this is review. I apologize for taking too much time with review, but do any of you have any question or comment? Any thoughts? Clear as mud, right? You got a hold of the pieces? Retain them as Pardon? Retain them as Retain it. <laughs> and I'm hoping you can retain it. So, yeah, I've, I've boiled it down to the simplicity. The basic point is right relationship with God, and it's number one, God is calling us to a faith relationship in Christ, whereby we obtain what? Salvation, reconciliation. Redemption, atonement, all of those things are ours in Christ. If you're ready, I'm going to go to, I think, the second handout. If I can find it here, I'll have one of them. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something. And this is all going to be introductory today. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 1. And I'm going to ask you to take this material with you and study it very, very carefully for our study next week. Now, typically, when we study the book of Hebrews, we start off in verse 1, verse, chapter 1, verse 1, and we take verse by verse by verse by verse by verse. Uh, we're not going to do that in this study. I want you to do it at home. I want you to study it. I want you to look at it because we're, we're going to be looking at some fundamental passages of great truths. The place of Hebrews now, you didn't know this, but I hope you'll leave today with an awareness of there are five Gospels. Give me the first four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What's the fifth one? Hebrews. Hebrews. <laughs> Give you something to hang your head on. Hebrews. <clears throat> that is a book that it sets forth. And there's one word that you will find a kindred term in the book of Hebrews that's going to talk about Christ and it's a very unusual word. It's going to talk about his majesty. The majesty of Christ. And that emphasis is going to come out again and again throughout the book of Hebrews. But again, we're moving in a direction in the book of Hebrews that I think you'll find very, very, very helpful. Uh, somebody read for me the first four verses of Hebrews uh, Mr. Kinnemer, can you read first four verses of uh, chapter one of Hebrews? God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in the times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath these last days spoken unto by his son, whom he hath appointed here, here of all things, and whom also he made the world. He who being brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word and his power when he had when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of majesty on high being made so much by then the angels and hath inheritance obtained and more excellent name than they all right oh uh, thank you for reading for me the first four verses, what do they tell us? Just, all, just quick, what do they tell us? How God spoke to us. God has spoken in times past. How? Uh, to, to, who were the fathers? <coughs> who were the fathers? God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers. Who were they? Patriarchs. Patriarchs, the people under the law of Moses, the patriarchs and the people of Israel. God spoke to them. He spoke to them by the what? Prophets. The prophets. And who was the most renowned prophet in the Old Testament? Trick question. Be careful. The most renowned prophet in the Old Testament. Got an opinion? Moses. Moses. 
Moses. Moses penned what? He just wrote five books. Didn't he? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, with the exception of possibly the last chapter of Deuteronomy. If you've read the last chapter of Deuteronomy, you know why I said with the possible exception of the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. The possible exception of that. Uh, in fact, you're going to find that Moses is, is very careful to always speak with regard to God's decree. And you've got the prophets, you began naming them in the Old Testament, you began naming them carefully again and again and again. And God spoke to the people of old uh, by the prophets. Now, here's, an extra, here's an interesting exercise. Did God ever say never? He destroyed Sodom, he destroyed Tyre and Sidon. And which one of those cities did he say it will never be rebuilt? <coughs> it'll be a place where the fishermen dry their nets. And that's all it'll be. And it was the center of commerce for hundreds of years on the coast of the Mediterranean. But God said it will be destroyed and will never be rebuilt. Guess what? It was destroyed. It has, to this day, never been rebuilt. When I, now, what I'm doing is I'm giving you something to do some study on. Uh, what about Egypt? How old was the kingdom of Egypt? Some surmise that it was possibly a thousand years in supremacy on the face of the earth. But when it was at its zenith, before the other four world empires came along, God said, I'm going to remove the Egyptians from ruling Egypt. And never again will another Egyptian sit on the throne reigning over Egypt. Interesting. Since that declaration, they've been ruled by Assyrians, Syrians, Greeks, Romans, and up until about 1940 what? They were ruled by the English and today, the Egyptians are ruled by who? Arabs, not Egyptians. When God says never, he means never. Uh, when, what did God say about Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon? World power. They, we know about Nebuchadnezzar, don't we? Nebuchadnezzar, did I get your attention when I said that? We know about Nebuchadnezzar. We know about all their power, all their reign, and, and they were at their zenith. And what God said is going to happen to, to the kingdom of Babylon and Babylon itself. You'll like this if you do research. He said it's going to be destroyed when the river gets conquered, when, it, when the river becomes its enemy. That's interesting. What river? Then he said when it is destroyed, it will never, never, Never be built again. Do we know where Babylon was? About 14 miles from the intersection of the Basra Bangladesh Railroad. That's where the ruins are. Guess who tried to build it back up and was building it up and all they could do was make an ammunition warehouse out of it? Saddam Hussein. Interesting. But God said, not only will it never be rebuilt, but it will be inhabited by the wild goats and the hyenas and the owls. But even the Bedouins will not even go there and camp at night and deposit their sheep around the ruins of, of Babylon. You get the impression when God says never, you can check him out. You can check him out. When God makes a prophecy or a promise, you can write it down in large letters it's going to come to pass. Now, I've given you that little exercise just off the cuff in case you are wanting to do some terrible study with regard to the word never and God using the term. But you begin, God, God has spoken in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, here's something rather interesting and I think fundamentally important. God is now what? Hebrews chapter 1. 
He spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. In these last days, what is going on right now? He is now, he is now doing what? Speaking to us by his son. Now, I would, the emphasis is appropriate, and I believe that it is fundamentally vital that we understand that Christ, God is now at this present. Yes, Jesus was here and he talked, and his ministry lasted how long? Three years. Three, and a half years. three to three and a half years. He was cut off in the middle of the week, wasn't he? Daniel said he would be. He was cut off three and a half years of ministry. But who is still who is still speaking? The Son of God is still speaking. He is now speaking unto us by His Son. Uh, we sometimes read and say, "Jesus, Jesus said this." Is He still saying it? Can you name a single thing that Jesus taught that is not still standing? A single thing that He taught. He is now speaking unto us by his son. Now, identify this son for me from the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Now, what you're going to need to do, I think especially, is look carefully at the first two chapters. We will course through some of it now as we have, have time. But I want you to look at what is said about the son of God in Hebrews chapter 1. Tell me what's said, John, in those first four verses about him. He is above all. His majesty. His majesty. Start with verse 2. He's been appointed everything. He's appointed heir of all things. Go he's, ahead. Been, he's given been given all the world. All right. Um, <clears throat> he upholds all things by the word of his power. He purged our sins. He sits at the uh, right hand of the majesty on high. He's better than the angel. He has an inheritance. Uh, better than what the angels have. All right. In fact, when you read the book of Hebrews, you're going to work, owing to the translation you use, you're going to run into the word better again and again and again. Some translations will say superior. Wasn't well, what the word better means. The word better means he's superior. But here he is, he is superior in his position because he's the son of God. He is the creator of the world. He has purged our sins. He is the brightness and the glory express image of his person. Cut to the chase. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Seen the Father. John chapter 10. To see him is to see the Father. Now here's the basic information. Now he is now sitting at the right hand of God, which is the place of what? Honor. And? Matthew 28, 18. All power. power. It is the position of power. Honor, yes, but position of power. And he's so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained the more excellent name than they. God has bestowed upon him. Now let's read a little bit. To which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? Today I have begotten you. Did God ever say that to an angel? Basic question, when did he say it to Jesus? Play it out. Give me your answer. Don't be afraid to talk off the top of your head. When did God say, today you are my son, this day have I begotten you? When did God say that? When he's baptized. Pardon? Matthew 3, when he's baptized. Right. Matthew 3, Matthew 3, he said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear you him. That's a proclamation. It does that. Is that the equivalent of what is said here? Matthew 3, write it down. When's the next time God speaks of his son? The Mount of what? Transfiguration. Transfiguration, Matthew 17. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, who's the audience? Peter, James, and John. And the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Is that it? Is that the day when God said, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee? Okay, turn to Acts 13. Which is in your notes, Acts 13. 
Found it yet? Mm -hmm. What'd you find? Uh, verse 33. Verse 33 says, This he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. What day was that? Raised from the dead. The day of the resurrection. The whole section begins up there about verse 29 and comes down. God has fulfilled this for us, his, their children. In that he has raised Jesus. And then he quotes, gives the location of the passage. The passage he's quoting is what? Psalm. Psalm 2. And here's the passage that he's quoting. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So all those others are of signal importance. Matthew 3, Matthew 17. But the day that God said, you are my son, this day have I begotten you, was the day of the resurrection. Add one more passage to it. Romans chapter 1 verse 4. Jesus was of the seed of David according to the flesh. You've got that already, haven't you? What else does the writer of Romans say? Verse 4. He was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, the question to be raised is, how is Jesus superior? He's superior to all as regards his position. He's the Son of God. He's superior to the angels. And we're not going to cover all of this. I want you to go down and read the language of, of verse 8. And here's a, a question that may well serve us, may serve us well. Who called Jesus God? God did. God did. Verse 8. Somebody read verse 8 for us. But of the Son, he says, that throne of God is forever and ever and righteous. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Hebrews. Yeah, Hebrews 1. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So who called him God? The Father did. And the Son, he says, you, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness and the scepter of your kingdom. And here's, here's something that's rather interesting. Verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has done something. What has he done? I anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Name a heavenly being who is superior to them. Christ is. Why? Because he's the son of God. Name any other being on the face of the earth with intelligence who is superior to them. Christ is. He has been anointed of God. And then the, the emphasis goes back in verse, verse 10, and it goes back to something already said. Uh, Through him God made the world. Verse 10 says, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the, of the earth and the heavens, the works of your hand. They will perish, but you remain. They will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will find, fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. I go into chapter 2 and just think for a few moments with regard to who Christ is. Who is Christ? And as a result of that, what his word is. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something. <coughs> I want you to think in terms of Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And you're going to find, I think, this answer fitting. In every detail, Jesus is one with the Father. That's what the first four verses say. He is one with the Father. Are they the same? No, there's the Father and then there's the Son, but they are one in wisdom, in power, and in, um, in every aspect they are one. That's the emphasis that is given. He is one with the Father. Man, the time got away. Go down to chapter 2. And I want you to know the language there in this particular section. Uh, I want you to look at what it said of, in verse 9. After, and we'll come back to this part next week. We see Jesus who was made how? Now he's superior to the angels, chapter 1. But what happened? He was what? 
A little lower than the angels. He was made a little lower than the angels. Why? <clears throat> For the suffering of death. To what end? By the grace Wait a minute. He not only... For the suffering of death, but he was also what? Crowned with glory and honor. Crowned with glory and honor that he what? By the grace of God might taste death for everyone. everyone. Now from there down through, from verse 10 to the end of the chapter, you have this particular point made. In every detail, in every aspect, in every way that it is possible, Jesus became one with us. He was 50% God and 50% man, right? Nope. No. Nope. What was he? 100% God and 100% man. 100% God and 100% man. I, that answer was given to me by a boy. I was teaching in the 8th grade. He said, well, that's easy. He was 50% God and 50% man. No. He's 100% God. He's totally and fully identified with the Father. And totally and fully identified with us. He was not pretending to be man. He was man. And he became man for a purpose. We'll talk about it at greater length. The Lord willing next week. But here's something for you to do some wiggling on. What's a mediator? Go between. In between. Somebody who intercedes it. He stands between two parties. And what must a mediator be? He must be what? Impartial. He must stand on equal standing with both parties. What is Jesus? Mediate. The mediator between God and man. And he mediates and has given unto us a covenant. Uh, any question or comment? I apologize for a quick review and a quick descent here. But we're going to deal with this material here on exercise number two, the Lord's willing, next week. You've got material in hand. I'm glad I brought it out. Uh, any, any question or comment? But now there's a point to be made that I want you to really grapple with. Maybe I can get a hold of it this way. It's an easy way to get a hold of it. Tell me what kind of relationship is a marriage relationship. Say marriage. Marriage. It's a. It's a faith relationship. It is a love relationship, but above everything else, what is it? It's a covenant relationship. Our relationship with God is a faith relationship. It is a love relationship, but according to the book of Hebrews, the only book in the New Testament that draws any attention to the subject, it is a covenant relationship. We'll talk about that, the Lord willing, next week. Thank you for being with us in our study. <laughs>